Hey, hey, how's it going? Good? Yes? I'm so excited to be with you guys. You all look so beautiful. Have you had a good time so far? Yes? I, I like, Steubenville is a high for me all the time, for the team as well. Um, and I've met a lot of you, but I don't know all of you. So I always say I can tell you a little bit about myself in like three slides. So here we go. This is Swaff. This is my husband. Um, the man, the myth, his name is Andy. No one calls him Andy. I call him Swaff. He's actually a professor. We live across the street from Benedictine College, if you know Benedictine College. Yep. I know there are ravens here. Um, and we, it's fun. He teaches theology and the students call him Doc Swaff or Swaff Daddy or P. Diddy Swaff. Um, my personal favorite is David Hassel Swaff, but you might not know who that is, so. Um, We've been married for 18 years and he is a good looking man, so, but not as cute as our kids. So these are our kids. This is my family. That's Thomas and Fulton and Kate and Colby and John Paul. Uh, John Paul's name is John Paul Benedict No Pressure. Uh, my children call him JP3 and I'm like, stop, not good. Um, and then a little over a month ago, we welcomed Avila Faustina. So this is my new baby. She is the best. She's super sweet, super cuddly. Um, I love her very much. She has a phenomenal name. She's destined for the convent, so it's gonna be great. Um, so this is my family, and I love showing this picture of my family because everyone's like, oh, Sarah, you're perfect family. And I'm like, <laughs> lies, all lies. I hate family pictures. That's why it's missing a kid, right? It's missing a whole kid. I just hate them. Thomas and Fulton are here with me this weekend. I, I, I called them out the other night. They're so fun, they're here. I've been doing Steubenville's for 11 years, and I used to always like hang out, and I was like, I can't wait till my kids come. But these pictures that you see don't tell the whole story, and I come here today to be real. So I put together this little video a few years ago. I call it the Sayers Here to Be Real. You can push play back there. Um, it's just basically I went through a bunch of pictures of myself and my family, um, just really terrible pictures over the years. This is me, no makeup at McDonald's. Um, this is a shot of my triple chin. If you want to feel really good about yourself, shoot at this angle. It's fantastic. I look constipated in this picture. I don't know what's going on. Uh, this is fantastic. That's family vacation. Um, Kate for the win on that family picture, absolutely. We're just a mess, like my family is just kind of a mess and it's totally fine. So that's Christmas card worthy, absolutely. Um, my shower cap was his favorite hat for a really long time. Lots of up the nose shots on my phone. So, and this is Colby. So Colby, used, Colby just liked to kill people. So he would kill people and then he would die. So, so he would just kill people and then he would die. So this isn't me, but I wish it was. So I always say this is the difference between Instagram and Snapchat, yes or yes, right? Yeah. I just show that video because I just want you to know I come here to be real and I wanna start this talk off by telling you, seriously, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of your fight. I'm so proud of the way you guys are navigating this world because you, have, you literally are playing with a deck of cards that no one in the history of the world has ever played with. Navigating social media, navigating post-pandemic, navigating online dating, navigating all these things that no one else has ever had to do. So if you ever feel like you don't know what the heck you're doing, you are not alone, amen? I went through, I went through junior high, high school, college, got married, had two kids before I sent a text message or knew what social media was, okay. I'm 40, not 80. You're like, oh, she looks great for 55. Okay, good. That's, I, I like all of your like, chaperones. Like, I miss social media by one year. One year. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, like, I'm fighting for you because I don't know what that would have done to me. In seventh grade, I was bullied so bad I had to switch schools. It was one of the hardest times in my life. Girls would, like, write nasty notes about me and put them in my book bag every day to make sure I could read them. Like, I don't, I can't even imagine what you go through because I know how deep that cut. I knew how hard that was. And I navigated that time. And I remember I, would, I was crying one morning before going to school and I asked my mom, I was like, mom, why me? Like the, the, the junior high guys just like deck each other on the playground. Can someone just deck me and this be over, right? Like, why do they keep doing this to me? And my mom looked at me and she said, Sarah, hurt people hurt people sometimes. 
And they must be hurting so much that they feel like they have to take it out on you. And that was really hard for me because I didn't understand it, but I, I had to take that step back and be like, is it me? And that time in my life left me with two wounds that I wasn't able to name until college. And those wounds were rejection and dismissal. And when I saw this talk, they asked me to give this talk. This talk is called Hidden Refuge. And I, I smiled because I was like, man, hidden. If that word isn't loaded, amen? I spent all of high school making sure that I never felt rejected or dismissed again. What does that look like? I'm sure a lot of you know, right? You play the part, you play the game, you try to get all the great grades, you try to play all the sports, you try to do all the activities, it, you try to make it look really good on the outside, amen? The image is real. Trying to keep up that image. Who do you date? Whatever, you know, the best possible option for you, right? You have to look good with this group of friends. You have to make it with this group of friends. You can like do the youth, I like did the youth group girl thing and I did the party thing and no one really knew who I was because I could hide and I was a poser and I didn't know who I was but I was really good at putting on a front. I was really good at putting up walls and each of them were different. And I would just turn based on who I was with. And I know that you experienced this. I know that you've walked this. When I was in college, I thought I had everything, right? I had a basketball scholarship. I was, I rocked it, I was valedictorian. I had an academic scholarship also. I was dating a guy that was great. He also went to the school. Life was good, it all looked good, appearances were good, right? I was completely hollow, but no one needed to know that. And when I went to college, the fir in the first two weeks of school, 9-11 happened. As a freshman in college, my world was rocked. That rocked our world. It was crazy. A couple weeks later, fast forward, I blow out my knee, season season's over. Halfway through the semester, my boyfriend of two years cheats on me. And I know a lot of you sitting in this room are like, oh my gosh, like, what? I mean, my whole world fell apart, and I know that a lot of you are like, she's telling my story, because so much has been taken away from you guys as well. My whole world crumbled, and for someone that deals with rejection and dismissal, it was dark. And I'm gonna be really honest with you, I was in a dark place. And I ended up transferring to Benedictine College. I came into that college thinking like, again, who, what front do I need to put on, amen? What person do I need to be for these people, for this group? And on the inside, the number one thing that I was, was bitter. I was bitter. Do you know why? Probably the same reason why a lot of you guys are bitter, because I felt like I played the game well. I felt like I had done all the things and checked all the boxes that the world said was gonna make me happy. And I had never been so empty in my life. And God was very far. And I had some girls and guys at Benedictine invite me to this like fall retreat thing. And I was like, I, I honestly said yes, just because so they would think that I was like in this God squad, amen? You all, I know, I know you know what I'm talking about. Like I said yes, because this was just another group that I needed to please. I'm a perfectionistic people pleaser, recovering. But I felt like I always had to say yes. And so I go on this retreat and they had confessions, and I hadn't been in a long time. I'm sure you guys have had that experience where you're just like, I actually got in line, got out of line, got back in line three times where I actually went. And I ended up going into that confessional, and that priest in that confessional gave me the best life advice that I have ever received. And he looked at me, and he said, Sarah, I want you to build a box, and I want you to put everything that you're struggling with into that box. And I want you to lay it at the feet of our Lord. I want you to give it to someone who can actually do something about it. It's too heavy. And I looked at him and I was just like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. And he looked at me and he said, Sarah, I want you to let the Lord love you like no human can. I want you to let the Lord heal you and put you back together. And he looked at me and he said, Sarah, you keep trying to go to all these different people, especially to these different guys, and you're trying to make them your God. And he looked at me and he said, they can't be that for you. They can't be your everything. And you are gonna always be disappointed because they're not perfect. And he looked at me and he said, Sarah, you don't need this, your, I'll be happy if and when, this like perfect relationship to be happy. He said, why don't you just let God be your savior? 
He wants to be your savior and he won't fail you. So let God be God and let men be men. He like articulated in my soul what I think a lot of you, like me, chase. I'll be happy if and when. If I achieve this, if I can keep this image up, if I win the approval of this group and that group and that group and that group, if, I mean, if this guy will date me, if the, you know, for the guys, like if this girl will date me, like then I'll be happy if and when. And when my world crumbled, that was the first thing that I thought was, it just, again, I had to, I felt like I had to be perfect and I had to keep everything together. And when I went into that confessional, he said to me, he goes, I want you to fall into the arms of our Lord, let him heal you and make you strong again and whole again. And when you feel ready, stand up and run. Don't look in any other direction. And when you feel like the time's right, glance to the side and see who's running with you. And maybe that's who you're supposed to be with. And I was like, Psh, holy mic dropped, like in this confessional, you know? And I remember leaving that confessional and my penance was to go out into adoration that night and to ask the Lord who I am. And I remember going out in confession, after confession and going out into that adoration and just sitting there, similar to what you all are gonna do tonight. Everything that has been said is leading you, has been massaging your heart to sit in front of our Lord. And I sat in front of our Lord and I said, who am I? And all I could hear back was, you are mine and you are loved. And I feel like for a lot of you, it's like, yeah, Sarah, I've heard that before. Like, I've heard it, but I don't believe it. Do you guys know what I mean? Like there's been a lot of stuff said from the stage. There's been so much truth thrown out there. But when I got into that situation where I had to ask the Lord who I am, I heard it, but I didn't always believe it. Because here's the thing, I was afraid to be seen by God. Why? Because I knew that if I wasn't enough for him, it was gonna be the ultimate rejection. And so I always played that game, which is like, I just gotta fix that, change that, get this ready, and then I'll like present, to my, present myself to God and I'll be like the perfect Sarah, and then he'll love me. How many of you do that with your family and your friends? I just have to like do this, 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 and that, and then they'll love me. When you do that with God, that is the complete opposite of the relationship he wants to have with you. God doesn't love you because you're perfect and because you're good. God loves you because he's perfect and he's good. And his love for you doesn't go up or down based on your performance. He is not a performance-based love. So many people in your life love you when you're useful to them. So many people in your life love you when you're doing something for them. God doesn't work like that. And I think he's hurt when we, when we act like that towards him. Does that make sense? You guys, this took me so long to figure out. We told the women earlier, like we were talking about all these wounds that we have, all this healing that we need to have done. That is like current in my life right now. That is current in the team's life right now. This talk is called Hidden Refuge. The scripture that goes with it is this one. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? I read that, I read that quote and I was like, yeah, they don't know that. And I'm gonna say it and they're not gonna believe it because you don't believe it. I didn't believe it. If I, you guys, if I, Sarah Swafford, could sit in the hallway like for like five days and just sit one-on-one -on -one with every single one of you and, co and convict you that you are loved, that you are beautiful, that you're good, that it's good that you exist, that you're not damaged goods, that you're not what your dad has said to you that hurt you years ago, that you're not what your mom has tried to like, in, in nagging perfected you, that you're not the sum of all the like terrible things that have ever been said about you. Like if I could sit and convict you of your goodness and of God's love for you, you know I would do that. Just bring me food, right? Just bring me food. And I will sit in the hallway for days and try to convict you of that. And you know what's, what's hard about this is that I can't. I can't. Hidden refuge. I hid from the Lord for so long. All I want for you tonight, forever, is for you to hide away with the Lord. Our whole team can't choose this for you. This is part of you like being this amazing, phenomenal adult in the church is that you get to choose. Our Lord will never force his relationship on you. That's the scary thing about the Lord. God gave us free will and you can reject him. 
like I did for years, or keep them at a distance and be like, yeah, like you're like a teddy bear, ATM machine, genie in a bottle. I will come to you when I need you, but I don't want you to see all of me because I'm afraid of what you'll say. But I'm telling you right now, you guys, you are a gift. And you're, I want you to sit and really listen to him, this hidden place. Only you and your prayer life and in your interior life can be convicted of all of this, all of it. I want it for you so desperately. Like my heart aches. It wants it so desperately for all of you, but I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is to believe that your life is a gift. And I know how hard it is to give your life away as a gift. But that's the whole ball game, amen? When you pray about discernment, like when you pray about God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life? The question is just like, how do you want me to spend my love? Every single vocation, every single thing that you're gonna ever choose has suffering has sacrifice. Is it hard? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. And what you need for your interior life more than ever, especially for your generation and, my, and mine, is grit. It's gritty. It's really hard to show up to have a prayer life, isn't it? Like, do you, have you guys ever had that? I have girls and guys come to me and they would be like, yeah, like people just keep saying like, just pray about it. And it's like, I don't know how to pray. I've never prayed before. I don't know what to do. Do you ever get frustrated with that? Where it's like, just pray. Like, I don't know what that means, right? Like, I don't know how to do that. It takes grit to show up to your prayer life. It takes grit to be virtuous. I argue that one of the most attractive things about a human being is selflessness, yes or no? Yes or no? Selflessness, yes? Raise your hand if you wanna marry a selfish person. I love it. It's okay, hey, you're interactive talk, girl. I love it, you're, you were ready. Nobody wants to marry a selfish person? Okay, how about this? Raise your hand if you wanna be the selfish person in your relationship. Nope, I'm sorry. Raise your hand if you wanna be a beautiful person, right? Yeah, okay, good, I got you right there, you got you. I'm teasing. What is my overall point? It takes grit to have a prayer life. It takes grit to have virtue. But do you know what takes the most grit of all? Supernatural grit is to sit in the gaze of Jesus Christ and allow him to heal you. Why is that so hard? Because it means you have to be honest and you have to be vulnerable about where you hurt. I want that for you tonight. I want you in the worst way to be able to come to the Lord and say, I hurt. I wanna share with you a couple quick, very quick practicals on prayer, because I know it's really hard. In reality, only in silence does man succeed in hearing in the depth of his conscience the voice of God, which really makes him free. Silence is hard. Who's afraid of being alone with their thoughts? Everyone just hold your hand up. Okay, good, right? Distractions are king. For Lent one year, I gave up listening to the radio in the car on my 30-minute commute when I was in high school. I would take the seatbelt and I would buckle Jesus in and I would talk to him and that's like where my prayer life started. Good visual for you, right? But that's like where I was. I didn't know how to pray. Silence, do not be afraid of silence. Prayer doesn't merely help our relationship with God, prayer is our relationship with God. Prayer isn't an option, y'all. It is your relationship with God. The best way to pray is the way you pray best. Whatever it is that brings you closer to God, do it. It's like an athlete, it's like exercise. Be consistent, right? Change it up, if it's, if it's not working, change it up. But the best way to pray is the way that you pray best, whatever that means for you. The time you spend with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the best time that you will spend on earth. Each moment that you spend with Jesus will deepen your union with him and make your soul everlastingly more glorious and beautiful in heaven and will help bring about an everlasting peace on earth. I think you guys are pretty convicted in that, right? Last night when our Lord came to us, it's kind of like the sun, right? When the sun beats down on you, it like changes your complexion. You just need time with him. And it's the best time you'll spend. And the last quote is Quo Vadis. I This has become a rally cry for my life. Um, it's actually the story of St. Peter. Have you guys ever, if you've ever been to Rome, there's this little church on the outskirts of Rome. <clears throat> it's called the Church of Quo Vadis. And there's this little bitty church there and it was over the site of a place where there was an encounter. 
And that encounter goes like this. Do you guys remember when all the apostles were sent out? Like, go, you know, like everybody was like, let's go. Let's like NFL draft. Like, who's my team? Let's go, right? And they go to like all the ends of the world, right? And they're like, let's go. St. Peter won the lucky ticket of Rome. My friends, Rome was a dumpster fire. If you think America's bad, do a little history, right? Like go and look at first century. He shows up to Rome, probably feeling pretty good about himself, right? And he's like, we got this, let's roll, right? He shows up to Rome. They are lighting Christians on fire and sticking them up poles at night and lighting the streets just to intimidate people. The Colosseum was built as like an arena, the way we would watch like a football game or a soccer game. They, Romans would like get into this arena and they would put people, Christians in the middle, and they would release lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And the whole point of the entertainment was to see who would die first and how. And they would eat and they would bet, and that was their entertainment. Roman women that didn't want their babies, they would go out to the city wall and they would take their baby and they would throw their babies over the wall and Christians would hide on the other side and try to catch them before they hit the ground. That was Rome. And he shows up and he's like, you people have lost your dang minds. I'm out, like you're crazy. So he leaves, St. Peter walks away from Rome. He's like, I'm good. He put on his bougie backpack and he left because I'm convinced every apostle had a bougie backpack. And he left and he was like, I'm done. And he walks away and this church is on the outskirts of Rome because in that place he had an encounter. Guess who was walking towards him? Our risen Lord. Christ appears to to St. Peter and St. Peter looks at him and he says, quo vadis, which in Latin means, where are you going? St. Peter looks at our Lord and says, Quo vadis, where are you going? And our Lord looks at St. Peter and he said, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified again. And he turned and walked past him. And that was the moment where the question was turned on St. Peter. St. Peter, Quo vadis, where are you going? And I have to believe that the conversation in his head had something to do with John 6. Do you remember the story And he told the other night? Like, to, he's the one that stood up and said, to where shall we go, Lord? You have the words of everlasting life. My friends, we can walk away from the fight. St. Peter had a choice. You have a choice. It's a hidden choice. You can put on this beautiful show. I put it on for years. You can look the part. You can fake everyone out. But there's a hidden place in your heart where that question, where are you going, it has to be answered. If I could convict you of your worth and your beauty and the love for you, and that your life is a gift, I would do it, and I will do it till the day I die. But you're the one that has to sit in that loving gaze. You're the one that has to go back to Rome and fight. And the grit that it's gonna take, the grit that it took St. Peter to walk back, you guys, he, he knew. He knew he was gonna die. He knew. He knew turning back around was going to his crucifixion. He established a church. It wasn't easy, it wasn't comfortable but he did it. Why did he do it? Because he loves you and because he loves me. He was was crucified upside down. He he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be killed in the same manner as our Lord. And he went to his death singing the praises of the Lord. There was a hidden strength in St. Peter and in all the apostles, but they all had to make that choice. And the same choice you have to make right now. Kovadis, where are you going? I want to go to heaven. I want to take as many people as I can with me. And every single choice that we make, the answer to Kovadis is a thousand choices every day, amen? The virtue, the grit to sit in your prayer life, to be able to have that interior life where you say like, Lord, I want you to see me. I want to be seen. I want to be loved. I want to be known by you. It is not easy, but it is so worth it. And that's what I want for you, not only tonight, but for the rest of your life. And I will go to my death fighting for you because you're worth it. And because I love you and because I'm proud of you. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, I ask you, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I ask you to come down upon this room and to place your hand on the heart of every single person in this room. Whatever has been stirred up today, yesterday, Lord God, I ask you to put your hand on the heart of the places that are hurting, the places that feel abandoned, the places that feel hollow, the places that feel worthless. Lord God, the places in their life where they've been used, where they've been hurt, where they've been left behind, where they've been left out, the places 
of anxiety, the places of pressure, the places of fear and doubt. Lord God, I ask you to place your hand on the heart of every single person in this room, whatever it is, Lord God, that is hidden from you. I ask that they maybe for the first time allow you in to be seen, that they will hide away with you and be open maybe for the first time of being loved by your gaze, in your gaze, so they can clearly hear what you're saying to them. That it's not just words, that you don't love them based on their performance. They don't have to earn your love. It's freely given. The question is just, how do they love you back? How do we heal enough to love back, Lord God? Help us today and always to have the peace and the joy and the freedom that the world cannot give. We have to sit in that hidden space with you. We love you and we give you all the praise and all the glory as we pray together. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.